Good evening, everyone. Uh, we're going to get started. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody here tonight to the 12th Annual uh, John T. Dunlop Lecture. Uh, my name is Eric Belsky. I'm the Managing Director of the Joint Center for Housing Studies here at Harvard, and very pleased that you all could uh, come and spend a little time with us and spend some time listening to our speaker tonight, uh, Jonathan Reckford, the CEO of Habitat for Humanity International, I think a, uh, uh, an entity that everyone in the room knows about, is familiar with, and probably many of you at one time or another have picked up a hammer or, uh, or a saw and uh, helped build a Habitat home. I'd like to talk just for a moment uh, about uh, John T. Dunlop, uh, for whom this lecture is named. Uh, John Dunlop was a uh, dean uh, of the Faculty in Arts and Sciences here at Harvard, was on the uh, faculty of the Economics Department, a towering figure in labor economics, and just a remarkable human being that, that the Joint Center for Housing Studies uh, helped in many times uh, keep the uh, center thriving through its history at Harvard, uh, and it's been a center here for 51 years, and for many of those years, uh, John Dunlop was a great friend of the center and a, just a remarkable person. Uh, to give you an indication of how remarkable a person he was, and one of the great benefits I had of, of being in this job is having gotten to know him, is he advised 11 presidents of the United States, starting with FDR and ending with uh, Bill Clinton. Uh, he was sought after, and his advice was sought after, by uh, leaders of industry and uh, by leaders in government. He was an expert in uh, labor relations and was frequently called upon to mediate uh, uh, different agreements. Uh, and while he was uh, a labor secretary along the way in the, uh, in the uh, Ford administration, uh, he actually resigned over a point of principle, which is a rare thing for a cabinet secretary to do. He was a man of enormous integrity. So it, it's wonderful to be at an event uh, that uh, carries uh, John Dunlop's name. It's also wonderful to be at an event with another John, in this case, Jonathan Reckford, as I said, who is the CEO of Habitat for Humanity International. And uh, Jonathan is a friend and someone I've gotten to know, and he's truly a, a, a humble person, but also an extremely effective, focused person uh, who really is trying to do things to improve housing conditions, not just for thousands of people or tens of thousands of people, but through Habitat for Humanity, hundreds of thousands of people. He leads an organization that has uh, helped more than 400,000 families uh, find a place to call home and an affordable place to come home. And it's, it's hard to think of better work that you could be doing in the world than that. So I know that he draws great uh, inspiration and satisfaction from doing that work. But he's also moving an organization uh, that has a global presence, uh, not just into more and more countries, but really understanding what are the issues and the challenges that each nation faces and trying to adapt his organization to meet those unique challenges. For example, in the United States, as we all know, a big challenge today uh, is what to do with uh, foreclosed homes that are in disrepair throughout the country and low-income neighborhoods throughout the country. And rather than continue to follow a model that the organization had followed to a significant degree of building new homes, they've gotten much more engaged in rehabilitating homes. This is just one way uh, that Jonathan is committed to being very focused on what the world needs and trying to be responsive and a servant to what the world needs. Uh, as a person who does this, uh, I think, from day to day, he gets uh, to a degree that perhaps we all should, just how important housing is to individuals, how important housing is to communities and building communities and a community spirit. And really, Habitat tries to both help individuals and, I think, build communities. And not only does he understand how important housing is, but that really housing isn't just shelter for people. It's really a platform. And he's fond of talking about housing as a platform. And it can be a platform that's a springboard to opportunity and to growth and to well-being. Uh, but if it isn't a springboard, it can be something uh, that mires people in poverty, in ill health, and create lo lifelong problems. And so he really understands how important housing is. And I think many of us in the room are focused on housing's importance to the economy and may have lost sight of how important housing is to individuals. And so it's a great honor to have someone like Jonathan uh, to be able to deliver a lecture 
uh, that looks at affordable housing and what he perceives to be myths about affordable housing that keep people from taking greater action. Um, I'd like to, uh, before I uh, call up Nicholas Ritzinas, who is a, a longtime friend of Jonathan's and serves as chairman of the board for Habitat for Humanity, who will offer a personal introduction of Jonathan and some personal reflections, I'd like to first uh, call and introduce uh, Gerald Caden, who's going to provide a greeting uh, from the Graduate School of Design. Uh, Gerald is a professor here of urban planning and design at the Graduate School of Design. He's also uh, leading the master's program in urban planning and design and is a, a legal scholar, another uh, great friend of the Joint Center for Housing Studies. To give you an example of the kind of person he is early in his career, uh, he, he clerked uh, in the Supreme Court for Justice Brennan. He's a really remarkable individual, an expert on land use, understands a lot of the issues about how land use and land regulation can uh, create the conditions for affordable housing or can hinder affordable housing. So with that, let me uh, turn the uh, microphone over to Gerald. So uh, thank you, Eric. Eric just did the uh, welcome. I'm doing the greetings. Uh, Ken Colton is doing something that's not listed, I think. Nick Ritzinas is going to do the introduction, and then we have the address. So uh, you'll see a deep categorical distinction between a greeting and a welcome, I, I trust, let alone an introduction and an address. Uh, so first, what I'd like to do is, is actually say to Eric Belsky and to Nick Ritzinas before him, how grateful we at the design school are, how lucky we are at the design school to have that kind of leadership at this enormously important center that's affiliated with the Graduate School of Design, as well as the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. It's a great pleasure to have all of the resources of the Joint Center uh, for our students and our faculty in terms of research and teaching, and then to have the kind of outstanding leadership that we have with Eric now uh, and with Nick and Eric before that uh, is just a, a great joy for all of us. Uh, housing is very important to us at the Graduate School of Design. We have an enormous number of students uh, in urban planning, urban design, uh, architecture, even landscape architecture, deeply interested in housing for the obvious reasons that housing is important. And I think there's actually a an increasing interest now, there's always an ebb and flow to what people are interested in. Housing is really now a core issue for our students and indeed for our faculty. And for that reason, in addition to having outstanding faculty members like Eric uh, and, and Nick, uh, although he's spending a little bit too much time at the business school to tell you the truth in my judgment, but that's because I'm a professor here at the design school and we're lucky to have them at Harvard anyway. Um, we're expanding our faculty in housing and indeed doing a search right now for the Dunlop chair, sound familiar, um, in housing, which will be a senior tenured scholar. And that search, and I'm intimately involved in it, uh, will presumably conclude this year. So this is something deeply important to us. So that's, that's I think, what you call a greeting. I think. I've greeted you. Uh, welcome to the Graduate School of Design. Our dean will be, I think, joining us later if he's not here. But on behalf of Moisen Mustafavi, our dean, and the faculty and the students, we welcome you here to the Graduate School of Design in Gund Hall. And now I will turn it over to, I guess, Ken Colton. Is that correct? Oh, he's, I'm sorry, there's a, yet another. <laughs> Just very quickly, uh, thank you. That was exactly the welcome and uh, greeting. <laughs> And now I want to uh, uh, call up uh, Ken Colton, who is a senior fellow here at the Joint Center for Housing Studies, uh, but is uh, here to greet you on behalf of the National Housing Endowment. The National Housing Endowment has provided uh, funding and sponsorship of this event since its inception uh, 12 years ago, so really has been a partner with us in this. He's going to offer uh, uh, some greeting from the National Housing Endowment, but I also do want to point out that the executive director of the National Housing Endowment, Bruce Silver, is also with us uh, here tonight. So thank you, Bruce, for your support over the years and your help in, uh, in arranging this event. And with that, I'll turn it over to Kent. Actually, Gerald, if you want to categorize what we're doing, I'm here to give the commercial. Uh, it, it is actually a pleasure to be here to represent the National Housing Endowment related to this event. Uh, I had the opportunity to be involved here in the first uh, Dunlop lecture uh, 12 years ago, and I just want to sort of clarify that. Uh, for some of you who were there, uh, I refuse to admit that 
it's 12 years later, but Nick, I mean, he's 12 years older, but I'm certainly not. So anyway, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here and to be a part of this because the National Housing Endowment, as Eric said, really has partnered uh, with the Joint Center for Housing Studies in a number of ways. This is one of the most significant ones. Uh, but in addition to that, we are uh, very much involved in the uh, Center's uh, Nation's Housing Report, uh, annual housing report, and appreciate the opportunity to work in that. And by the way, I should mention that Bernie Lieberman, who is on the advisory board, was key in providing the uh, National Housing Endowment support this year for that uh, report. So we appreciate all the involvement with respect to the National Housing Endowment. Let me just take a moment and tell you a little bit about the National Housing Endowment for those who don't. It was formed in 1987. Uh, over that period of time, it has raised $22 million and given out $10 million in grants that have primarily been focused on education and research and training. And uh, right now, the, the focus of the program uh, is on something which is called HELP, uh, Home Building Education Leadership Program, where it really focuses on uh, providing grants to universities who are involved in construction management, residential construction management, to help them either start or expand two-year or four-year programs. So it's really involved in educating people who will work in the home building industry and I think is playing a very important role there. We love John Dunlop. We appreciate his role. He was indeed a member of the board of the National Housing Endowment for many years. We are also very pleased to be here to uh, recognize and listen to Jonathan Reckford. Uh, I personally, and I know many of the people here, have personally been involved over the years with Habitat for the Humanity. We appreciate the great job that you're doing, and it's just a delight for the National Housing Endowment to be a part of the Dunlop Lecture tonight. And so now at last to introduce our speaker is Nick Ritzinas, uh, my friend and colleague for uh, many, many years. He's on the faculty of the Harvard Business School. He will provide a personal uh, introduction. But I would say that Nick, like Jonathan, uh, doesn't just talk the talk. Here's a man who really walks the walk in virtually everything he does, really a towering uh, figure in housing and really a national figure to introduce Jonathan. After Jonathan gives us his remarks, he's agreed to take some questions. So we will have time for questions as well. So with that, let me turn it over to Nick. Thank you, Eric. It's great to be here. It's great to see my friends and colleagues from the Policy Advisory Board. Thank you for hanging on uh, in the most difficult times one could possibly imagine. I want to thank the National Housing Endowment uh, for your support. Uh, Gerald, thank you, and not only you, but the other faculty and students from the school who are here. Thank you all for being here. I want to acknowledge our two first two Dunlop lecturers are here, Ken Colton and Barbara Alexander, who did such a great foundation for this. Thank you both for, for joining us here. Um, Eric was kind enough to invite me in large measure because Jonathan and I had an important intersection at a particular point in time. Um, while I am paid to teach, I was paid to run the Joint Center, my principal volunteer activity for many years was Habitat for Humanity. And I was on the board of directors of the International Board and it was an honor. And those of you who support Habitat, I thank you for that support, both past and going forward. Uh, we, we had a critical point, a critical juncture over in the history of Habitat for Humanity. Uh, we no longer had our founder with us, and we had an organization that was a shining star, but when you looked at that star closely, it was frayed. There was deferred maintenance. We had the message, we had the charisma, but we didn't have the infrastructure in place. And how do you replace, how do you go after an individual that says, help us fix and help us build? And we spent a lot of time trying to find that individual. Well, there's an old saying, an old Buddhist saying that I use sometimes when I speak across the river, which says, when the student is ready, the teacher will come. Well, in our particular case, Jonathan came. And he made a difference. And he taught us, Jonathan's going to talk about three myths. He taught us three things that I want to share with, with each, of our, each and every one of you. Because Jonathan comes from a very special background a background that is both faith-based and very heavily private sector oriented. He taught us, one, that mission is not an excuse for inefficiency. Indeed, mission makes it imperative that you're efficient because you're using someone else's money to get things done. He taught us, number two, that passionate professional is not an oxymoron, that if you are, if you are passionate, you should be professional about undertaking what your passion is. 
And most importantly, he taught us that shelter is not the end of a game, it's the beginning of the game. That it is not just a safety net, but if it really works, it's a trampoline. And in this period of time, in the last several years where he has led Habitat, he has built the infrastructure to make it not only an organization that is the brand in affordable housing in the United States of America, but indeed has a footprint in over 90 countries around the world. So it is a great privilege, a great honor to introduce this year's Dunlop lecturer, Jonathan Reckford. Nick, thank you so much. It is, and Eric, thank you. It is both a, an honor and very humbling to be in a room full of housing giants and so many uh, old friends and, uh, and I hope new friends as well as we uh, think about the huge challenges of how we solve housing together. Shortly after I joined Habitat for Humanity in 2005, I visited the tsunami devastated areas of Southeast Asia. During that trip, I encountered a developmentally disabled gentleman named Samwang Chiachan. He lived in a community of Mokan, or sea gypsies, in a corner of southwest Thailand. Historically, the larger society has shunned the Mokan people, and sadly, because of his disability, uh, they further discriminated against Mr. Chiachan. Before the tsunami, he had no role in their fishing village. He lived in a two square meter lot in a small shack worse than a lot of dog houses in this country. Even before the storm, his future looked pretty bleak. As the community began rebuilding after the storm, however, the elders of the village decided it was unacceptable for Mr. Chiachan to continue to live in those conditions. They didn't have any more land, so their solution, uh, which I thought was wonderful and had the privilege of dedicating, was to build the first three-story watchtower in their community, with incidentally the best view in town. So along with his new house, the village also gave Mr. Chiachan the job of watchman in case there were future storms. So that for the first time, he not only had a decent place to live, he actually had a decent pla a place in his community. The upheaval that followed the tsunami caused the neighbors to rethink their opinions and change their behavior. Have you ever held fast to a certain belief until you are faced with a new reality? When something shakes us to the core, often we're motivated not only to change our opinions, but to change our behavior as well. I look out on this audience and see a lot of experts in the room. Collectively, we've evaluated thousands of pages of data, established goals that sounded both reasonable and audacious, and made fervent appeals on behalf of housing. Despite all our efforts, however, I'm not sure we've done a good enough job of creating a common narrative to use when we talk about shelter. We need to stir people more and cause them to realize how adequate housing for all affects them personally. I want us to consider tonight what might be possible if we rededicate ourselves to changing perceptions and moving people to action. This evening, I'm going to focus on three myths related to affordable housing and why those beliefs are so wrong. My hope is that you'll walk out of this room either persuaded or reminded that access to affordable housing is a vitally important issue that impacts everyone in society. I want you to join me in the belief that people of widely varying incomes can be successful homeowners. And I hope we might leave here as better advocates with a renewed sense of urgency we're diff tackling the huge challenges we're facing in this country and the world. Many of the issues I'm going to raise are complex. I'm going to ask questions I know we can't answer tonight, but I hope they'll spur conversations that we need to have. It's important for you to know the context for my remarks, which you've heard. Habitat for Humanity seeks to find housing solutions in partnership with families who cannot otherwise obtain financing for decent housing. Our focus is on affordable housing, and we do that in the context of promoting home ownership. Next week, Habitat will celebrate two important milestones. In observance of World Habitat Day, uh, we're going to finish building the 500,000th Habitat House worldwide in Mahu, Kenya, and then immediately raise the walls of our 500,001st home close by in Patterson, New Jersey. Through the efforts of millions of volunteers in more than 80 countries around the world, 
Habitat's helped half a million families have new or improved housing. While we've made great progress, we will not let our hammers or our voices rest and as we continue to work and advocate for safe, decent, and affordable housing for all. The first myth I want to address goes something like this. Sure, housing is important, but when you think about all these other critical social issues, it's not at the top of the list. Healthcare, education, and jobs, for example, demand more attention and resources. The reality is that health and education suffer and job opportunities diminish if affordable housing is not available. In fact, the lack of adequate housing directly undermines society's massive investment in health and education. Consider the recent headlines. Government officials have wrangled endlessly about health care and jobs, particularly in relation to the federal budget. Obviously, these issues are critically important. But think also about the number of people nationwide who've lost their homes in the last few years. Foreclosures and plunging housing prices have left many people stunned at their new predicaments and have wreaked havoc on local and national economies. Having a place to call home, a place to feel secure, is foundational. Knowing that you can remain in your home without the fear of being evicted or forced to leave makes a world of difference. A decent place to live creates stability, launching families into a promising cycle of possibilities and progress. A home offers warmth in winter, shelter from wind and rain, a barrier against disease. For girls who fear sexual assault, simply living in a place with a door that locks provides security. And for the world's poor, a simple, decent home offers a respite from the daily battle for survival. However, for 1.6 billion people around the globe who live in poverty or substandard housing, shelter and stability are elusive. It's intolerable that 10 million people worldwide die each year related from conditions related to poverty housing, poor sanitation, and unsafe water. That's more than 1,100 each hour, almost 20 per minute. Study after study has concluded that poverty, inadequate housing, and poor health are inextricably connected. An Emory University research study in Malawi found that children under five living in habitat houses had a 44% decrease in malaria, respiratory, or gastro gastrointestinal illnesses compared to other children in the community. And Lisa Harker, a British child poverty expert, found that poor housing conditions increase the risk of severe health problems and disability by up to 25% during childhood and young adulthood. Safe, solid housing, on the other hand, eliminates many of the environments that pose health threats to children and parents alike. Let me give you an example. Candace George is a college-educated professional, but she doesn't make a lot of money as a fraud investigator for the city of New York. She's also a single mother with five children. Before partnering with Habitat, all six of the Georges lived in a one-bedroom, fifth-floor walk-up that was infested with rats. So many and so bold, the children actually began giving them names. The rats weren't the only health hazard confronting the family, however. Candace's baby boy, Daniel, had become really sick. He started having asthmatic seizures so severe he had to be rushed to the hospital. He would always recover rapidly, but each time, then he would relapse after he returned home. A city health inspector eventually identified the cause of these attacks, toxic black mold surrounding the windows of the apartment. Candace knew she had to get Daniel out of that apartment. Once the family moved into their own Habitat row house in Brooklyn and into a healthy environment, everything changed. Daniel's now the healthy, lively boy you see in the lower left of the picture, and that's the front porch of their row house. When looking at the link between health and housing, it's not a huge leap to see that health also, housing also has a huge impact on education. Overcrowding, inadequate light, leaky pipes, and deteriorating walls at home make it difficult to concentrate or study. A safe, quiet place to learn is not only an environment which one can study, it's also a space for planning and dreaming. According to a University of Tennessee study, the children of homeowners in the U.S. are 25% more likely to graduate from high school and 116% more likely to graduate from college compared to families who don't own their home, children in families who don't own their homes. 
Now, I want to be fair. The research doesn't answer all the questions. Can we say definitively that their academic success is directly tied to home ownership? Are the findings more about children not having to move year after year or have the instability of rental housing? We don't know. What we're certain about is that home ownership creates stability both for families and communities, and stability increases academic achievement for children. Around the world, we see that stable housing has a positive effect on both health and education. We also find in many cases that home ownership positively influences family income and spending habits. We've seen adults over and over, go, over and over again increase their own levels of education, earning degrees or completing professional certification courses after buying a home. We hear frequently about ambitious homeowners who receive raises, promotions, or improved jobs. Nationally, more than 7,000 students drop out of school each year, each day. And the CDC indicates that 7 million children in the US suffer from asthma or other diseases triggered by dust mites, mold, cockroaches, and other pests. What would you do if your child was becoming chronically ill because of the place you lived and you absolutely could not afford to move into a healthier home? What policies must we as advocates for healthy housing rally around so children won't have to suffer because of the environments they live in, so that they can have a place to be healthy, study, learn, and imagine? Another myth I often hear is that affordable housing is someone else's problem. If this recession has taught us anything, it's that housing is, important, is as important to community health as it is to individual health. Investing in affordable housing attracts new businesses, creates jobs, and many times makes communities safer. When these investments are absent, communities struggle, and the ripple effect is devastating. Eventually, those ripples affect everyone. Housing is not a product. It's a process. And housing at all economic levels has to be set in the context of community, involving many people and organizations. If we're to provide affordable housing for all, then the public, private, nonprofit sectors have to come together. We're seeing this clearly because of the housing crisis. Foreclosed and vacant properties are draining the life out of neighborhoods and surrounding communities all across the country. At Habitat for Humanity, we had to step back and determine how we could best serve both families who couldn't afford decent housing even before the downturn and the communities that were now moving backwards. We encouraged our affiliates to think not only about new construction, but also to consider repairs and weatherization. Purchasing foreclosed properties to rehab and sell at affordable prices to low-income families has been a core strategy for Habitat. In the process, we focused on creating partnerships within communities to address the multiple challenges of declining neighborhoods. We've, in effect, become a catalyst for neighborhood revitalization. This is the Cherry Street community in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, which until recently had been in decline for decades and also become a haven for violence. A local Habitat team met with neighbors whose desires were very clear. Rid the neighborhood of vacant, blighted housing and do something about the crime. They had a vision to make this neighborhood with such a rich history inviting to young families again. The Habitat affiliate announced plans to replace 16 of the worst homes with new ones. Because of that commitment, private developers purchased and renovated six more houses, as well as historic apartment buildings in the community. Soon businesses, community leaders, schools, and other groups came forward with their own resources and big ideas for change. Take a look. The results have been amazing. Since the project began three years ago, crime has dropped 50% and drug offenses are down 70%. In fact, when I was touring the area, I spoke to a police officer named Billy, who's now a volunteer uh, in the community. He told me, if you'd been here three years ago, I would have been here to protect you. The big sweep of his hand, he said, now look what we've done. Can you believe that's the same street? Run that back one more time. The city manager told me that when he feels overwhelmed, he drives to Cherry Street to remember what is possible. And now a 10 square block area with Cherry Street at the center is the focus of a larger neighborhood revitalization effort. Remember, the process started with the residents of the community. 
when they were able to give voice to their dreams, when they were eager to invest themselves in the solution, other people started getting excited. Success required all sectors to get involved. So how does this all come together? Let's look first at the public sector, which creates the context and environment for private investment in housing. One of the critical roles of government is to regulate land use. The best community designs include mixed income, mixed use developments that include the foundation for future growth. Offering sense incentives such as density bonuses or requirements for inclusionary zoning helps assure that affordable housing options are available in our high cost communities. Governments also establish infrastructure. Affordable housing works best when it's in the right location, near transit systems, shopping areas, and good schools, and when it's close to areas where residents work. A third role for governments, especially in the international arena, is to develop policies for land tenure. Some 80% of the world's population lacks title to their home or to the land that it sits on. Adequate housing opportunities are dependent on the government establishing and enforcing laws for property protection. Developing sustainable housing is almost impossible without clear tenure policies and an honest legal system. Thriving communities also require investment from the private sector, which has the unique ability to mobilize capital and to go to scale. But if businesses have to make a profit, they're less likely to gravitate toward low income markets where the margins are lower and where properties are harder to sell, right? Not necessarily. With the upper end of the market overbuilt, we're seeing new models that are incorporating some very creative ideas. For example, a private developer in Australia's elite Victoria Harbor sold the lowest three floors of an eight-story upscale apartment building to Melbourne Affordable Housing, which in turn is selling the units to those who work in service industries, childcare workers, teachers, police officers, etc. This was a win-win because the with the recession, the economics of the building didn't work when the developer was trying to fill eight floors, but by offering more modest homes on the bottom three floors that have no harbor view, the numbers worked for the developer, and low- and middle-income families were able to afford housing in the area where they work. So where does the nonprofit sector come in? A common thread in successful community development projects all around the world is the engagement of the local community. This seems obvious, but it's amazing how often the voices of those who will be directly affected, particularly in low-income areas, are left out of the planning and conversation. Doing this right is slow and messy. Every community has a few of those extra grace required folks, but community engagement throughout the process is essential. The hard work of bringing people together is what the nonprofit community does particularly well. Let me give you an example from our work in Aceh, Indonesia, following the 2004 tsunami. Prior to the storm, few people in Aceh possessed secure tenure or title to their land. The tsunami destroyed not only all of the houses, but it destroyed all the documentation and the physical landmarks that delineated property lines. Clearly, we didn't want to rebuild on land where tenure could later be challenged. So we worked with residents to create community maps. The families marked off what they believed to be their property lines, and then we mapped it, and they had to obtain the signatures of every adjoining neighbor that that's where the property line ought to be. Then once we had the maps, we helped them get approval from various level of levels of government, and those became the official community maps. Once families had official documents for land rights, we could then start building permanent homes. Without this collaborative process, it would have taken years, if ever, for the government to have put titles back in place. Uh, but within a few months, we were able to work with the families and begin building again. Here's another quick example of a community collaboration. In a village, uh, this is a process we're do replicating across northeastern Brazil. This is a community called Varjada, and previously the people lived in mud huts where the walls were a breeding ground for beetles called kissing bugs. An energetic leader in this community called Doña Tata told me about these small beetles that feed on the skin at night, usually on the face, and leave behind a parasite called Chagas disease, which can fatally damage the heart muscle. According to Doctors Without Borders, the disease kills 15,000 people in Latin America every year. Simple housing improvements can eliminate that threat for many families, meaning the difference literally between life and death. 
Habitat partnered with the families to build one another simple block homes with a concrete floor and a proper roof. This eliminated the environment for the kissing bugs. Dona Tata also told me about the lack of water during the long dry season, which lasts much of the year. She explained that she and other women in the community had to walk four miles every day to collect water. So in addition to building healthy homes, we partnered with the Methodist Church and alongside each house built a large stone cistern. And we designed the roof systems to capture all the runoff in the rainy season, providing enough safe drinking water to take the family through the dry season. The state and local, local governments, based on these investments, came in and built the first school and clinic in the community. And the women, who no longer had to spend half a day fetching water, uh, had harnessed their embroidery skills, and with the help of World Vision and the National Bank of Brazil, created a profitable micro-business in embroidery that has provided both income and socioeconomic representation for them. We see this in communities all around the world. Improve housing and businesses grow. Many homes serve as workshops, manufacturing units, warehouses, and retail spaces. These allow homeowners to improve their living standards over time. Habitat's Cherry Street development, our efforts in Varjada and other communities, as well as the project in Victoria Harbor, they'll state clearly the transformations that can occur when the public, private, nonprofit sectors come together to solve big challenges. The revitalization of these communities also emphasizes, once again, that stable, affordable housing is central to education, health, employment, and economic development. The State of the Nation's Housing for 2011, developed right here, says that more than 2.2 million mortgage loans are currently in the foreclosure process. What would you do if your situation changed drastically and suddenly you could no longer afford to live in your home or even in your zip code? What can our organizations do collectively to make a big impact on the huge housing foreclosure crisis in this country? How do we mobilize all three sectors at a scale to change the, uh, the current trajectory? The final myth I want to address is that home ownership really isn't for low-income people. This is absolutely not true. A few years ago, home ownership was widely and unwisely encouraged. Now many are arguing that purchasing a home was a bad idea for low and even middle income families. Rentals being touted as a better option. The reality is we need the full spectrum of housing solutions in our society and that people of many income levels can be successful homeowners. Exactly who are the families struggling to find housing they can afford? Many of them are people we encounter every day. The people whom we trust to care for our parents, teach our children, and protect our neighborhoods. Discussions about low-income home ownership can be extremely complex, or they can be as simple as imagining a family either continuing to live, live in a cycle of poverty or having the opportunity to break free, make changes, and discover a world of hope and promise. Home ownership, especially for low and moderate income families, has taken a bad rap because of the housing crisis. Purchasing a home, no matter what the income level of the buyer, ought to require a mortgage with fair and reasonable terms that are fully understood by the borrower. Lenders should also should confirm sufficient family income to cover monthly mortgage payments and other associated living expenses, including utilities and transportation costs. Perhaps it really is that simple. Perhaps the only real problem is we strayed so far from that path. The housing crisis arose out of a giant affordability problem. Prices escalated far faster than incomes for many years. Now property values have fallen, but financing has all but disappeared for low and middle income families. We still have a huge problem with access to affordable housing. But it's not just about low income families. An article ran in the New York Times last year that said regardless of whether you're talking about a primary residence, a second home, or a house bought as an investment, the rich have stopped paying their mortgages at a rate that greatly exceeds the rest of the population. More than one in seven homeowners with loans in excess of a million dollars are seriously delinquent, according to the article, which also suggested that the rich might simply be dumping financially draining properties. A Las Vegas agent for luxury apartments cited 
that the wealthy made plans based on the best of all possible scenarios, that their incomes would continue to grow, and that real estate would never drop. Not many had a plan B, he said. The suburbs reflect the same struggles across demographics. In the states with the most foreclosures, rates in suburban areas rival those in center cities, and rates in predominantly white neighborhoods differ little by income. In the current political climate, the expectation is that federal housing subsidies will be reduced. So where do you make those cuts? Who ought to suffer the most? At Habitat for Humanity, we believe that owning a home is a power move for many families. One homeowner said it, it powered the creation of his own small business and helped him to afford to send his children to college. A single mom said at first owning her home was a dream come true, but now it's a push to do something greater. Because we set out to help families succeed, the majority of Habitat families are thriving. And foreclosure rates across the country remain extremely low, around 2%, even though we only lend to sub-subprime families, and even in cities where foreclosure rates have hit 20 and 30 percent. We've now been offering these subprime mortgages for 35 years and are seeing more and more families fully pay off and uh, completely own their homes. And that success comes as a result of preparation, education, and accountability. Habitat homeowners are carefully screened for need, ability to pay, and willingness to partner. That partnership agreement includes financial and homeowner education. When difficulties arise, Habitat affiliates work with their family partners to help them stay on course, even when holding prospective homeowners accountable is tough, as in this last example. While preparing documents for real estate closing in Michigan, Habitat affiliate leaders discovered that the prospective homeowner had run up quite a bit of revolving debt uh, between her last financial review and closing. She'd been doing her sweat equity, putting in hundreds of hours of work on her home and other families' homes. That's part of the requirements for receiving an affordable mortgage. She'd worked long and hard, and she was excited about moving in. However, the amount of new debt she'd incurred was too high for her loan agreement, and she couldn't close on the house. She told me it took nine months to pay down the credit card debt so that she could close on her home. She said she was devastated when she first got that news. But now she looks back and says it was the best thing that ever happened to her. She now has no revolving debt. She's saving money and, uh, and successfully paying her mortgage. Having the accountability of the Habitat Agreement changed her financial behavior. We also emphasize the importance of treating homeowners as partners and having families participate in their own housing solutions. Families in Mississippi and families in Mongolia help build their homes and pay off no-profit mortgages. Condominium residents in Eastern Europe and community development teams in Indiana are examining local challenges and working together to find answers. When people invest their time, money, and effort into improvements, they gain the dignity of knowing they've accomplished something significant. Often they're eager to take on new challenges and seek additional opportunities as well. Ideally, Habitat for Humanity and other low-income housing providers not only help improve current housing situations, but also serve as a stepping stone for upward mobility. Who do you think are the best candidates for home ownership? Upon what do you base your decision? Can you recall a time when all you needed was a little help to make a down payment, to be able to afford a car that would get you to work, to pay your tuition? What happens to those who have no one to reach out to for that helping hand? What can, we, what can we as leaders in the housing industry do to help create paths to upward mobility, to replace this downward spiral of housing and hopelessness? I stipulated from the beginning that I was talking to you as an advocate for home ownership, and I stand by that. I want to repeat, however, that home ownership is not for everyone. Rental is the best option for many families across income spectrums and many lifestyles. After more than three decades, of working with those who can't afford market rate rents and market mortgages, Habitat has found that home ownership provides many families with a path to self-sufficiency through the ability to build equity by paying down debt. We believe that whether you're in the affluent suburbs of the U.S. or the slums of India, resources are available to address these problems. So we'll continue to seek ways to help more families improve their living conditions. 
as you contemplate the answers to the questions I've posed today, I urge you to think beyond beams and rafters, outside of walls and fences. Consider the impact of stable housing on health and education in communities all around the world. Ponder the fact that poverty housing affects everyone across demographics, and it takes everyone to address the challenges of ensuring adequate shelter for all. I believe we must develop new and integrative housing solutions because the reality is if children don't live in decent homes, they don't stay healthy. If they're not healthy, they don't do well in school. If they don't get a good education, their chance of getting a good livelihood and breaking that cycle of poverty plummets. All the pieces have to line up if we're going to maintain healthy and thriving communities. Solutions to many of these housing issues lie right in this room. Sometimes we get caught up in the busyness of housing, but let's never lose sight of these basic truths. Housing is foundational. Housing problems affect everyone, and it takes all sectors of society if we're going to deal with them. And settling into stable housing can be a power move for families and can bring new life to the communities they live in. I want to leave you with a phrase from Habitat that always encourages me. A world of hope, it starts at home. May that spark of hope begin with us here tonight. Thank you. As I said, as I said Jonathan has agreed to uh, take questions, so uh, we'll take uh, questions from the audience for a few minutes, and then I'll have a few closing remarks. Thanks, Jonathan. Yes, In Eric's introductory remarks, he talked about uh, you adapting your business model to incorporate uh, foreclosed homes, which is a very different endeavor uh, because Habitat has been built on the engagement process of one building their own home. Could you comment on, on how you've adapted and, and the challenges that you've encountered in making those adjustments? Thank you. It's um you know, the axiom uh, I've, I've been promoting is let's be religious about our principles, but not religious about our tactics. And Habitat wasn't founded to build single family stick built new construction. It was founded to deal with poverty housing. And so uh, we have actually always done rehabs. It just wasn't a primary focus. And they're harder and there's complexity. So we needed more training. We needed more better processes. We needed a lot of education and support for the affiliates. But it was so clearly the right thing to do in those communities that had these high foreclosure rates. And it was, um, and then we kept the homeowner principles exactly the same. Families still had to participate, still sweat equity, uh, still volunteers coming alongside. Need a little more higher level of professional supervision for rehabs. Obviously, in some older homes, need uh, uh, you know the uh, the paint and uh, mitigation pieces are more complex and are less volunteer friendly. So it does create change, but we found we can still do the same principles. It just uh, and it was so clearly from our perspective the right thing for those communities that 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 overweighed the. The inconvenience, but there was clearly a change process to, you know, um, to get our 1,500 affiliates to uh, to see the world in a in a new light, and that's been. I I think uh, if in the in the mode of don't waste a crisis, um, the magnitude of the downturn I think you know was a catalyst to moving much faster than than we might have ever been able to move in a sort of normal environment. Uh, Jonathan, you talked about the 35 years of subprime mortgages that you've been giving. I wonder if you could expand a little bit in terms of those subprime mortgages, because I think that's a fascinating part of what Habitat does, uh, both in terms of the source of funding, if you will, and then the process by which people qualify. Thanks, Kent. It is, um, when we talk about partnership, uh, essentially they're, they're one of the myths for Habitat, I think there are two myths I shared with some folks earlier about Habitat that are broad, widely held. One is that President Carter started and runs Habitat, which is actually not true, though he is certainly a, one of our, our by far most visible volunteers. Um, and the second is the idea that we give away the houses. And core to the, the idea of Habitat from the very beginning is the idea of this partnership. And so we bring together uh, primarily private funds and, uh, and pri corporate funds uh, and occasionally government supports, particularly around land or infrastructure. 
and, uh, and then the families pay a no-profit mortgage, and all of those funds revolve in the same community. And so when the families pay, they know that they are both a recipient but then a donor for the next family. And I think that ties both to the dignity of that partner family who feels by the time they've put those hundreds of hours of sweat equity and they've gone through the education and they're paying that monthly mortgage that uh, it's not a charity case. It's, uh, they, are, they are partners in the process, though clearly there's subsidy involved. So there's a philanthropic piece, which is, is the subsidy to buy down the interest rate to make the mortgage affordable, but the families have a, a significant stake and are earning it through their sweat equity down payment and then through their monthly payments. And, and, and I realize it will vary by officials whose interest rate would end up being about on average. So this is uh, where it gets a little more complicated. In the U.S., we have a, no, a zero interest rate, uh, which has been the long tradition. In the rest of the world, we charge inflation. It's no profit, but in high inflation markets, uh, we end up tilting too far to charity if we, if we didn't. So we, uh, we recapture inflation, but don't make, there's no, no profit margin built in. So it's... Uh, but we always try to make sure our target is to make sure that the sort of total cost of, of the home doesn't exceed 30 percent of a family's income uh, so that they can still afford to feed their families, get their kids in school, and, uh, and do the other pieces. So, it's, um, so it is, in that sense, a tough to scale, but I think the principles of what have made those families successful uh, would cross, you know, are valid across all housing situations. We used to call that basic underwriting, a 30%. Uh, it's anyway, not such a radical uh, idea. A uh, uh, quick two-part question. Uh, have you considered other forms of ownership tenure uh, in terms of condominium, cooperative, limited dividend, et cetera? And given your clearly expressed, you know, not anti-rental, but we are an ownership organization, do you think there needs to be a Habitat for Humanity type of organization that uses much of your approach but is on the rental side. Oh, great. So on both fronts, on the first side, absolutely, yes. So one of the ways we, can, we can't afford without, uh, in the high-cost markets, our affiliates use a variety of mechanisms. And we're very focused, actually. Nick helped pass the first financial sustainability policy from the international board. So in the high-cost markets, we use a mix of land trusts. So the family owns the house, but not the underlying land, which takes the cost way down and ensures stability, you know, long-term affordability from the city's perspective. Uh, we use shared equity models and other models that, again, can lower the cost, but minimize, you know, manage the subsidy per family in, where land is terribly expensive. You know, uh, it is so we um, are very sensitive to that. We're actually doing leverage models where we've actually got banks or other groups to finance the mortgages and we just pay the, the interest uh, payment uh, or buy down the interest rate from them. So we're trying to use a variety of market mechanisms. We're now financing mortgages. I think actually three years ago we, we had the only successful mortgage financing in the U.S. Um, because we have zero losses on our mortgage portfolio, uh, which is now I think a billion and a half dollars. But it is... Um, so, so very much yes. On the rental housing, I want to be clear, I'm a huge fan of the need for good rental housing as well as it's just not our distinctive. And what we really didn't want is the pendulum to go so far the other way that people uh, cease to, to believe in home ownership because we've seen how much both for the individual families and for communities, some percentage of home ownership helps in that stabilization and anchoring in the community. Uh, but I think there is a desperate need, and I actually think one of the gaps now in the rental side private sector does an amazing job providing rental housing, but it's, it's actually then the community glue and sort of the partnership at the, at the, on the community side to do the, some of the same work to prepare those families to have a path so that they're, well, they're successful renters. And, and I think we're going to have to, we need more of that as well. Thank you. Jonathan, uh, you talked a little bit earlier about this, the international aspect of uh, what you're doing. Can you clarify a little bit how big that is? Because I was pretty shocked at how big that is compared to the U.S. effort. And then also kind of what you've learned internationally that can help both uh, kind of at home and abroad. Thank you. It is, I think, a surprise because our, our brand has grown so much in the U.S. that only about 10 percent of the families we serve are here in the U.S. Now, the dollars tilt much more heavily that way because of the cost of, of housing. The average cost for a Habitat house outside the U.S. is about $4,400, so a significant uh, discount. And we're building you know, houses for AIDS orphans in some sub-Saharan Africa for $800 to $1,200 a house. So you've, you've got a, a huge spectrum out there. Um, but last year, we helped about 81,000 families worldwide, about 9,000 U.S. 
the rest in, in the rest of the world. And so the, uh, the dramatic growth has, has been there. I've been struck more and more how much the principles actually cross over, even though the, the contexts are so different. And in fact, some of the tsunami learning was huge for us in our Hurricane Katrina response as we thought about rapid scaling. So we went from very small programs to building 25,000 houses uh, to, for tsunami victims. And we'd never done anything at sort of that magnitude before. And then we took that and took tiny affiliates along the Mississippi Gulf Coast and, uh, and Louisiana and scaled them at 25x. Uh, per affiliate by using some of the same principles, even though, again, of course, the, the homes and processes look very different. And then we leverage those scaling techniques to non-disaster environments and sort of push them back. But sometimes the, the crises allow you to, to do things that you wouldn't, that would be difficult culturally and from a change management perspective. Um, so I, I think we do see ideas going back and forth. The other area is in housing finance. Some of the most innovative housing finance has come from housing microfinance in other countries, and now we're sort of pushing those back uh, and bringing some of those ideas back, thinking about how we structure our financing. Uh, given that, <clears throat> excuse me, given that U.S. public housing policy has largely been a failure, what, if, from your experience, would you say that the um, uh, public sector is missing and lessons that you think they should take from your philanthropic side to addressing the larger public housing needs? You know, uh, there are a lot of people in the room could give much more eloquent answers than I on this one, but, you know, I would, I would brag about one of our board members. Renee Glover in Atlanta, I think, has, has done a, a, an extraordinary job of replacing sort of the, the, the post-war big projects with mixed income, mixed use communities. And we've seen really strong results. And I, you know, there's a debate out there. It displaces some families. There's, you know, we have to acknowledge some of the trade-offs. But when you look at the net result for the families in those communities, it's, I think it's been a tremendous success. And I think some of that piece um, where HUD is embracing sort of the post-Hope hope Six, uh, you know, healthy communities and you know, affordable housing with access to transit uh, as well as, uh, as energy efficient are both things that I think are, are being embraced. Um, but I think actually those same principles, I don't think the government can do it if it's not, you know, I think government setting the context for the private sector to do the development, but then bringing in the nonprofit sector to do that community organizing, that, that is a key piece of making it work. Because if the voice of the community isn't part of that planning and design, I think that's where we see, um, I think they were left out of a lot of the, the, that early master planning that created such bad uh, early examples of public housing. And I think we've all learned a lot. Hi, um, I was wondering, in terms of uh, the financing aspect, whether you think that institutional investors, such as mutual funds, insurance companies, or commercial banks, have a special role um, as opposed to institutions that finance themselves by equity in um, contributing to housing policies. You know, I think absolutely. Um, you know, we've gone from, you know, you know really esoteric mortgage financing that got so far divorced from the, the original family. If you look at the, you know, the value chain breakdown, and I think everybody was at fault along the entire spectrum, if we're, I think if we're honest, um, to now nobody financing. And so clearly we need securitization. Uh, you know, I, would, I would call on Nick, who knows 100 times more than I do in terms of you know, how do we now get from where we are to you know, a, a model that still has the ability to securitize loans and create that financial efficiency and leverage, but in a way that doesn't create the, the sort of adverse selection that we had in the buildup to, uh, to the markets. But it is, you know, I think we, we absolutely need institutional investors. I mean, even for Habitat, we've got sort of social investors that are giving us below market debt to finance our mortgages, and, and, uh, and it plays a huge role that allows us to build more. As long as you're efficiently reinvesting those funds, that's an accelerator for nonprofit and for-profit developers. Um, I was just wondering if you had considered alternatives to single-family homes, if not in the United States, maybe internationally, where more collective societies um, would be willing to sort of share living um, arrangements or spaces. Thank you. We um, actually the habitat was the original habitat uh, concept came from a small uh, interracial Christian collective uh, farm in South Georgia, which in the 1940s, which. Uh, if you can imagine, wasn't very popular in the 1940s in South Georgia. 
Um, and, and the original idea of partnership housing was actually families coming together to help these tenant farmers improve the terrible shacks they were living in. So it, it sort of deepened the heritage of our work. We don't only build single family. So in New York City, we build condominium buildings in, you know, in San Francisco. In the high cost markets, we build uh, vertically. It's harder for us. In most, all the high cost markets, we're building at least townhome, if not condominium style. Internationally, in places like Manila or other, again, so high cost urban markets, we, we build multifamily. But it's still condominium home ownership for the individual families. We have not, uh, from an approach perspective, we have not. I would say there are certainly large communities right now that in our Japan response, um, you know, very traditional that families would be in community, eat together, do so. We would follow and build to the cultural norms of the community and try to design housing that fits the context and norms of the of the communities that uh, that we're serving. But it is, um, but generally it has been. Uh, sort of individual, I, the exception I would say there are a lot of places where we build for extended families. So we might have an extended family sharing a, a slightly larger home with multiple generations and, and groups. So you would design the house slightly differently uh, for that. We'll take one last question from Rick. Okay. How do you engage volunteers in the high rise construction in the, in you know, the, in the uh, expensive markets? It's a big tension. Um, you know, it might not surprise you that with our insurance company, we do not have them on the outside walking the, uh, walking the beams. So what happens is, that, is they, they only do the interior fit out. Uh, and we've seen some creative things, sort of like that Australia example in Toronto and some other places. Condo developers got d density bonuses if, if uh, one or two floors could be habitat or affordable, and then they could uh, build a bigger building. And then our volunteers would just do the interior fit out for all the units, and the families could still put in their sweat equity. So I think there are creative ways, but obviously it has to be safe. Well, I'd like to thank Jonathan for obviously taking a great uh, deal of care in preparing his remarks uh, in reminding us how important housing is, reminding us that we can all play a role and we strengthen our role by doing it in partnership uh, with a variety of other individuals, uh, organizations, and sectors. Uh, reminds us uh, of just what we can accomplish if you start that small ball rolling and you keep it rolling and you roll it intelligently. And I hope uh, not only did you get a chance to hear Jonathan's ideas, but you got a sense of the man and why I think uh, we're all so fortunate that he's at the helm of Habitat for Humanity International. So with that, I'd like you to join me in thanking Jonathan. Thank you, Thank you very much. It's, it's, we could probably have gone on uh, listening to Jonathan's answers to questions which were so thoughtful for some time, but we're sensitive to everyone's time. So I want to thank everyone uh, who came uh, to the event for coming, and I'd like to thank on the Joint Center for Housing staff, especially Pamela Baldwin um, and uh, Angela, who worked uh, diligently on putting this uh, event together, Angela Flint. So thanks to the staff at the Joint Center for Housing Studies, and thank you. And uh, with that, enjoy what is looking like as a somewhat warm and pleasant evening here in Cambridge. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>